Tucker Carlson is back with another episode, this time sitting down with a favorite of ours, Glenn Greenwald, where they discuss the stunning hypocrisy on the right when it comes to free speech issues. To me, though, is that the right, the American political right, which really was through this kind of weird transformation that's happened over the past dozen years, has become the lone defenders of the First Amendment. They've abandoned that in the last month, like, instantly. So I think you could say, you know, I strongly support Israel. I strongly dislike Hamas. I'm, I'm rooting. For, maybe I think we should commit troops to the region. I mean, whatever. You can have any view you want. However, American citizens have a right to express their opinion, period. And that supersedes a any other event in any other country. It's like that's a core right. And I don't hear many conservatives saying that. Uh, and so you sort of wonder, like, if they're not defending it, who will? I mean, there are people who have built their careers, Tucker, over the last five, six years, standing up and saying, we can't have cancel culture, we can't have censorship, college students aren't entitled to feelings of safety, we don't censor in order to protect people from views they find threatening, mocking the notion that minority groups are vulnerable and we have to censor in order to protect them, turn on a dime and now become the leading voice of saying, because American Jews feel unsafe, that's valid in a way that, say, claims from black people or LGBTs or Latinos aren't valid. And because of that, we need to censor. Yeah, I think that was a really powerful conversation with two folks who have a lot of um, respect in this space for their consistency and strength and advocacy for speech issues over the years, staying true uh, to their beliefs. Uh, Glenn Greenwald obviously used to be a First Amendment attorney. Tucker Carlson is someone who I think many people that are more left-leading are we're skeptical of, you know, does he really care about these speech issues or does he only care about, care, uh, care about them insofar as they advance his political agenda? At least in this moment, he is among the very few conservatives who have stuck the landing. Yeah. And, and Glenn, uh, to his credit, um, noted a few on the right who have been uh, still coming out against cancel culture for the pro-Palestinian advocates like Vivek Ramaswamy and Candace Owens, who warned against, um, you know, totally... Uh, deplatforming or de, you know deprofessionalizing the Harvard students, that kind of thing, um, but but the in the broader landscape, yes, there's been a a quick rush to turn the tables as if that's going to benefit um, contrarian and dissident voices on the right. Next, you know when the when the news cycle switches and you're again being targeted for by cancel culture, by censorship, or by whatever it is, and then you're going to say, no, 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 pro uh, offensive views should be protected and people shouldn't suffer um, disproportionate consequences for saying things that offend or provoke. Um, it's, it's not, at, at some point, it's not a principled, you're not really against cancel culture or censorship if you just think you or people agree with you shouldn't suffer any consequences. That's just that's just boosting your own team. That's just, you think, yeah. at some point you think people you don't like and disagree with that they should be canceled and you should not be canceled, which isn't a very principled stance. Well, Maybe that I just mean, honestly, is what it is. But it is, that is a principled stance if you don't well, think. Well, it's not a principled stance. It's, it's a like, consistent, it's, it, it, is, it might not be your principle or my principle, but it is a principled stance. It's a consistent stance to say, I don't think that um, free speech is an absolute good thing or something that should be an absolute right, that I have my values and my beliefs and that I am for things that allow those to get out there and my ability to advocate for them. And I'm against people I disagree with from being able to advocate for theirs. That is perfectly consistent. So I have seen some conservatives say, well, why should I care about the hypocrisy of the right when the left, so many of them were interested in cancel culture? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of those cancel culture people never said they cared about free speech to begin with. So yeah, they are consistently saying, I believe that I, I should stand against what I'm describing as fascism in the interest of historically marginalized groups. I've always been against you and I will use whatever tools I can to keep you down and elevate my own cause. So you can't use somebody else's perceived hypocrisy as a shield for your own, especially when they never, they weren't the ones that cared, uh, claimed to care right. about free speech. You were. And as Glenn pointed out, people have built entire media empires around the idea that they are classical liberals and they're the free thinkers and they're the ones that aren't afraid of ideas. And over and over again, I, I got to say, as someone who's on a, a leftist who advocates for free speech as an absolute principle, much more like uh, Glenn Greenwald does, 
it's not surprising to be in this situation, and it has been frustrating to see folks effectively co-opt what is, I think, a really important issue. What for their clearly, what are clearly purely political and self-motivated reasons. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I, I really care a lot about free speech issues. That was before I had a you know TV hosting situation. The main issues I wrote about in my capacity as writer for Reason Magazine were speech issues particularly with college campuses and then also on social media when that became more of a thing. Um, I've tried to be very um, calling out censorship I see on both sides so that nobody mistakes me for just advocating for one side or the other. I don't know why they would mistake me as advocating for one side or the other anyway, because I'm not really partial to one side or the other. But I try to do a lot of that. And now I have felt a lot of frustration from, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll often be, the second something happens, some censorship event affect it where the target is a liberal or progressive or leftist person. For some reason, there, there will be this bad faith assumption that I don't care or I'm not going to say anything about it or I'm not going to write about it. Even, like, I, I get hit with that even while I'm in the process <laughs> of calling it out and writing about it. You don't know how many times I'll read a tweet saying, we'll be, I'll be waiting forever for, you know, Robbie Suave or Connor Frieder's door for Jonathan Chade or Fire to call this out, even though me and so many of those people do in fact call that out. Or, I mean, Basically that every do, time we're called to account for it. I think you do and Fire does. I don't know about some other actors. There is some inconsistency there. And I know that not everybody can write every article on everything, but when you start to have I'm selective busy, I'm bias. Busy guy. I gotta hang out with you for yeah, three hours well. a day. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that, that people people do have a selective kind of emphasis on what they talk about. Now I think for example this conversation was recorded before Rashida to leave censorship. Uh, sorry, yeah, Rashida mm -hmm. to leave censorship by the by the house. I would love to hear Tucker also weigh in. I'm sure Glenn, Glenn already has online, yeah. but Tucker weigh in more specifically on do you support yeah. that? Because he is a really powerful voice and a really persuasive voice for people who are disappointed in some of the hypocrisy that you've seen in establishment Republican media and in politics. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear what he had to say. I don't know. I can't speak for him. He, he might very well have thought that was a that was a dumb move. Some, just a few, but some Republicans, um, including Thomas Massey, who I've been a big fan of um, for years, uh, because I do think he yeah. is a very principled person, and and he is he has been out there saying, look, I I am on Israel's side in this conflict. I I I, su I support them with rhetoric, but I don't think we should be giving them um, I, I, a, a blank check or you know tons of. He's he's been against funding foreign countries all the way along, and he's not suddenly getting swept up in in some kind of legislative fervor based on what's happening, and I was glad to see him. Well, now he's a house. Hamas toady, and he's well. just going to have to live with that kind of a marker. Well, Tucker and Glenn also discussed how politicians exploit overseas wars to manipulate Americans here at home. Their real aims are domestic. They use foreign conflicts to make change in the United States, to make the country, in fact, less democratic. But they use those conflicts abroad to divide the United States. So we're going to do this. We're going to spend all this money. We're going to imperil America's national security. And if you don't like it, then you are a tool of fill in the blanks. Saddam, Putin, Hamas. It, it seems like a uniquely poisonous way of running a country and not at all good for the country. No, I think that's exactly right. If it, it, it would be bad enough if the United States were just going around spending all of Americans' money to fuel foreign wars. But what they're doing at the same time with these foreign wars are using them as a pretext to erode the core constitutional and civic rights of American citizens here at home. So when they wanted to launch the so-called war on terror, they ushered in the Patriot Act that gave vast powers to the FBI and the CIA of all kinds of detention and surveillance powers. They empowered the NSA to spy on Americans without the warrants required by the Constitution. Newt Gingrich wanted to rewrite the First Amendment in order to usher in censorship measures in the name of the war on terror. They did the same thing with the war in Ukraine. Some of the greatest censorship on big tech came from those people who were questioning NATO narratives, who were standing up and saying, I don't think these things are true. I don't think these things are wise. The EU made it illegal to even give RT a platform. So every single one of these wars results in fewer and fewer rights for Americans here at home. And now we're seeing the exact same thing, Tucker, with 
this insistence and the Biden administration is fully on board in partnership with Republicans to provide billions and millions of dollars, not this time to Ukraine to fuel their war, but to Israel to fuel their war. And what we've been seeing from the people advocating that is this insistence that those who stand up and say, I'm not in support of what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. I don't think the United States should treat this war as our war. You don't have to agree with that or not, but there's so many efforts now to say people saying this should be censored. What yeah, and Tucker's been raising those issues for a long time. I, he used to have me on his show on Fox News um, to talk about a lot of those same issues, how, our, um, our, how the war on terror affected civil liberties here at home, uh, free speech, the widespread spying on American citizens, um, the ordeals we go through at the airport. Um, all, our, we, we gave our liberties away so quickly, or I guess we allowed political figures to seize them from us, and we didn't do enough about it. And that was a disaster, and we regret so much of it. So we don't want to make those same mistakes, but our political figures give every indication that they would like and, to and do it, so. And it really is just the beginning. I do, I do sometimes get frustrated because I, I think that some of the things that we focus on are the smaller. They're not unimportant, but they're the smaller of the things. Um, you know, some of the minutia of some of the Twitter files, some of it was bigger than other mm-hmm. bits. But we've, you've got platform, uh, apps being shut down because they're being used by trucker protesters to organize in Canada. Mm-hmm. You have people who are protesting Cop City precluded, not only precluded from um, doing bail fundraising for folks who were arrested for handing out flyers, but that the bail fund itself is being shut down on the basis that it is promoting terrorism. You have a nonviolent uh, boycott, divestment, and sanction movement against Israel prohibited in many states, or at least prohibits you from having a federal contract if you engage in it, um, and basically criminalizing or you know, penalizing people from having political views in a lot of these southeastern um, conservative-led states. You have people whose views I vehemently disagree with, but like Kanye West, not only getting deplatformed from apps, but unbanked, not being allowed to use J.P. Morgan services, even though J.P. Morgan, as we've discussed at length, seemed to have no reservations about its ongoing multi-year-long continued relationship with Epstein, even after he was convicted of sex crimes against minors. And on and on and on down the list. There are ratcheting up criminal penalties for protesters who you might not care about because they're environmental protesters. But when you realize you can go to, to jail for nine years, like Jessica Resniak, for protesting an oil pipeline, what do you think that's going to happen the next time there's another one of these ones? The one six protesters, some of whom got disproportionately long sentences for clearly political reasons, all of this should be a concern to all Americans, because we can see how unified the government is on the question of war and how unified the government is on the question of stripping substantive rights and protections away from the American public. Amen. More rising right after this.